Joining me now is best-selling author of such titles as The Madness of Crowds, The Strange Death of Europe and The War on the West, now in paperback, the great Douglas Murray. Douglas, let's start with President Joe Biden, who was in Ireland this week where he declared am at home and he then managed to mix up the all blacks with the black and tans one as you know is the new zealand rugby team and the other is an infamous british military unit that killed many irish republicans during the irish war of independence you see this tie i have with the shamrock on it this was given to me by one of these guys right here <laughs> was a hell of a rugby player and they beat the hell of the black and tans oh god Yes, it was a, um, an infelicitous uh, slip of the tongue uh, by President Biden. Um, it, it's an odd visit, this, because, of course, um, as, as you know, Rita, um, President Biden has said that he can't attend the coronation of King Charles in a few weeks' time. Uh, uh, but he did turn up for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday uh, agreement, which is the agreement that took place in 1998, which brought an end to the 30 years of troubles in Northern Ireland. And uh, to a great extent, it was a sort of a, a sort of it, it seemed to be a sort of trip down memory lane or a sort of um, happy place tour for President Biden, who, of course, uh, loves to talk about his Irish heritage, but actually has had a rather um, unfortunate role in his career in terms of peace in Northern Ireland. And indeed, the Democratic Party, uh, which he, he is the head of, um, has had a terrible reputation uh, in brokering uh, mm. the peace deal. Uh, you know, even now, uh, senior Democrats like Chuck Schumer uh, call for, for instance, the reunification of Ireland, as they say. They say the unification of Ireland, which is which is like a British MP turning up in America <laughs> and calling for Texas to succeed from the union. Um, so actually, uh, President Biden's trip, uh, it was obviously pleasant for him. It was obviously pleasant for his family members who all went along with him. Uh, but it wasn't a very pleasant thing to watch, and it didn't really do any diplomatic good. Uh, Joe Biden had no involvement in the Good Friday Agreement, and actually, in the 1980s, uh, was a, a pretty awful force for uh, the protection of people who were on the run from uh, Britain, not least for terrorist activities. So I would have liked to have heard a little bit more from President Biden about what he'd got wrong uh, uh, in his own past about Northern Ireland and about the conflict. But instead, we got treated to this sort of typical Biden-esque, uh, uh, let's say, sort of uh, slightly warped trip down memory lane. It was bizarre on a number of fronts. I mean, the gaffes we're used to, but you're right, the diplomatic message it sends, certainly some in Britain are looking at this and interpreting this as the US and the White House showing contempt for Great Britain. And as you said, why not t turn up to the King's coronation? He's already declared he's not going to be there. Now, you wrote a really important piece this week for the UK Telegraph on Xi Jinping's plot to dominate the world. And mm. that seems to be succeeding quietly whilst the West is preoccupied with uh, trivial nonsense and America's uh, more divided than ever and China advances. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the points I wanted to bring across, and I've been trying to bring across for some time now, is it's very striking that if you look at the, the rivals and competitors, indeed enemies of, of America and the West in the 21st century, they all think in incredibly long cycles of history. You know, uh, we think in, in our democracies, in Australia and Britain and America, in sort of two year cycles, four years, five years seems an infinitely long time in our politics. But of course, the Chinese, uh, like other competitors and rivals, they think in very long terms. And, you know, whilst we have all of the froth of uh, politics in our own countries and all of the idiocies that go along all the time, China is very busily getting on with the business of trying to become the dominant global power in the 21st century. We saw it recently, I mentioned in that piece, with the China-Brazil uh, uh, deal, which very interestingly, various people commented on, but the most interesting thing about it was that it circumvented the use of the US dollar. Uh, that is a very mm -hmm. telling sign, Rita, that, 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 that both Brazil and China were able to do a deal of this size and not have any involvement with the US dollar uh, is a sign of a serious tectonic shift happening underneath us in our era. 
And I just wish that more politicians in all of our countries were aware of that shift and aware of what it meant and actually got down to the serious business of trying to make sure that we, we effectively are able to compete with this power which is so desperate to compete with and overtake the world, world's democracies. And it is doing such an incredible job. You mentioned some of their economic might there, but they've just recently brokered peace deals between the great Sunni and Shia powers, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, something that uh, has shocked many Middle East watchers and has all sorts of uh, consequences as yeah. well. So, yeah, China is just quietly doing uh, what it wants and uh, the West is uh, turning on itself. Now... Part of that has been all this talk we keep hearing about reparations uh, for slavery. We know about the madness in California, but now we've got King Charles, who is signalling his support for further research into the British monarchy's <laughs> historical links with the trans transatlantic uh, slave trade. And the king has not ruled out, Douglas, the possibility of paying reparations. Uh, do you think the king of England will also consider reparations for, I don't know, the families of the Brits who were sold into slavery? Does he even know that that happened? Yeah, I mean, it, it's extraordinary. I, I, I can save him um, uh, the time and um, a certain amount of money uh, by by telling him uh, what, what the what the historical situation is. I'm sure he's aware of it. I'd, I'd like to think that this is a sort of outmaneuvering by the king and that he's well aware that actually the history of the British monarchy <laughs> Uh, is a very noble history by the end about the slave trade. The, the, uh, King, King uh, George III signed the Anti-Slavery Act in the first decade of the 1800s. Um, uh, you know, consecutive British monarchs uh, after the British abolished slavery, not just in Britain but across the empire, and then policed the abolition of the trade across the high seas. Uh, consecutive British monarchs spoke out incredibly forcefully, as well as enacting actual laws against slavery. So it's, it's a rather strange thing for King Charles to, to do. I'm hoping, as I say, that it's a sort of um, uh, uh, some kind of bluff of a kind uh, uh, so that the people who say, aha, we're going to finally get the secret history, because, of course, after all, Rita, uh, uh, the history of the British monarchy is incredibly secretive. I mean, uh, nobody has ever commented upon it and there are no books <laughs> on it. And there's no way there's no way you could find out any of this stuff from simply oh, going to a library or something. Um, I'm hoping that this is all all to sort of pacify the, the know-nothings and then educate them, to use one of their favourite terms, in the fact that actually the British monarchy and the slave trade is, a, is something to be proud of. Uh, the British monarchy led the way in the abolition of slavery, uh, long ahead uh, of much of the rest of the world. Africa continued slaving for decades, still does in parts today. China has effectively a slave uh, market these days in workers. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, uh, what the king is thinking, but I hope that it's 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 a great bluff to 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 call out all those ignoramuses who think they know everything and think that if they turn over any rock in the West, they just find evil. And in fact, in actual fact, on this occasion, as on so many others, you'll find some bad things, but you'll also find an awful lot of good. And, and how shocking and upsetting that'll be for a certain type of person. Well, it won't be, Douglas, because they'll just ignore that and focus on the couple of bits of uh, uh, bad things that they didn't know before that they'll find yes. out through this investigation. Now, I mentioned the fact that there were Brits, white British people, uh, Europeans, mm. who were also victims of the slave trade. You've spoken yes. about this. I know you've written about the, uh, the Arab slave trade as well, but this is the sort of stuff that isn't known widely and mm. isn't talked about. I mean, you, for all we know, could be entitled to reparations. Perhaps one of your ancestors were one of these unfortunate Brits who fell into a, yes. the slave market. Yes, the Bar Barbary pirates and the North African slavers uh, had ships. Uh, we used to go out and snatch people from coastal towns on the south coast of England, around the coasts of Britain, actually, uh, uh, and across uh, southern Mediterranean Europe. Uh, around a million or so uh, people uh, were thought to have been abducted in that way and sold into slavery in Africa. And that's ignoring, of course, the millions upon millions, the tens of millions of, of Africans who were sold into slavery by their fellow Africans. Uh, so if, if people are going to talk 
about reparations, as I've said for a long time, uh, it, it better be a fulsome reckoning. Uh, and people might be surprised about who has to pay money to who. Well, yes, that will be fascinating. Now, we know the world's richest man, Elon Musk, owns Twitter nowadays, but this week he also well and truly owned the BBC after this <laughs> train wreck of an interview with the BBC's James Clayton. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't use... I, 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 honestly, I you don't... You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you said actually, a, lot of people, a lot of people are quite similar. I, 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 only, well, well, I only look well, at my, on a second. My you said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, I, then I how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been, I've been using, I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right, and, and you I, can't I, give a single I, one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes. <laughs> Douglas, do you think the BBC <laughs> learned anything from that humiliation, or are they just going to double down on their hate speech disinformation? It was an extraordinary interview, wasn't it, Rita? I mean, an absolutely extraordinary interview. The BBC has some fine journalists in it still. It certainly has historically had some of the best interviewers in the world. Uh, I don't think that a Jeremy Paxman or an Andrew Neil would have gone in and ever have gone into an interview like this so completely unprepared as this man, uh, Clayton, did. Uh, he, he seemed to have no facts at his fingertips. And if you're going to if you're going to interview the world's richest man, one of the most interesting people on the planet, who's doing some of the most fascinating and groundbreaking work of anyone on planet Earth, you ought to go in with more than oh, I've heard about Haiti, Haiti, Haiti words. I, I mean, there's something sort of totally <laughs> pathetic, a nursery kindergarten about this, isn't there? This sort of, oh, I have a narrative about Haiti, Haiti words, and I'm going to stick to it. And, oh, I don't have any examples, but then, uh, then who, who cares? This journalist in question actually did a thread on Twitter about all the stories that had been reported by oh, the New York Times and the usual lists of, of media on the back of the interview. And he completely buried the lead. The lead was that he himself knew nothing and was exposed by Elon on Musk during the interview for knowing nothing. You know, this guy didn't even ask Elon Musk about the Twitter files, about what had been unearthed since Elon Musk mm. bought Twitter, or why Twitter was so successful after Elon Musk fired so many of the staff, in fact, more successful. This is just an example of the way in which sections of the mainstream media adopt a narrative, stick with it, even in the face of the facts. And they, they turn out to have no facts themselves. And then they sort of resent it when somebody else has facts and calls them out on it. I thought it was an utterly pathetic interview. I was embarrassed for him as a journalist. And I was embarrassed as a British person to see somebody of this sort of kindergarten level trying to play in the big boys field. It was just embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And the arrogance to go into that interview so yes. unprepared. You are dealing with a man, whatever you think of him, who's the world's richest man, he's wildly successful, and it seemed to have no respect for that. I think he thought, I'm the smartest man in the room and I'm going to show up Elon Musk, and that is not what happened. Uh, Douglas Murray, no, you're is. always the smartest man in the room. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> me today. It's a great pleasure as always.